Hello, family and friends. Day 247 of reading and studying through the Bible in 365, Hawaii edition. I'm still here. We're flying out here in a couple of hours, getting right back on a plane. So thank you for letting me be able to just do Bible study from wherever I'm at. And today we are hearing about the judgment against the surrounding area. So all of these chapters up to this point in Ezekiel have been the judgment against Israel and against Judah. And now, of course, as God always does, he doesn't just leave these loose ends. We are seeing the completion of the judgment against the people who came against Israel and against Judah, beginning here with a prophecy against Ammon and the Ammonites. And before we get started, if you are new here to Bible study, please let us know where you are in the world. I'm here in Hawaii, normally from Vegas, uh, and we have people from all over the world. And you are right on time in starting this Bible study. I always say going back to the beginning and starting at day one is highly recommended because then you get that really good foundation. I have people every day asking me, should I be you know, in real time with you or should I go back? I always say go back because you don't need to be you know, on time, in real time with us because everybody is starting at their own pace, going at their own pace. A lot of people starting on day one all the time. So don't feel like you are behind by any means. And if you need anything or you have any questions about this Bible study, take a look in the description box because I have a lot of info in there, including, you know, the supplies I use, the Bible that I have. This is the ESV translation and lots of Bible study tools and resources. Also, if you've been here for a while, if you could help us by giving this a thumbs up if this Bible study helps you. And also make sure you're subscribed and hit the notification bell. And then we also have a Facebook group that you can join where we are having conversation after the Bible study is done. And we will more so have conversations later on as we move into the next chapter of what this ministry looks like. So thank you for being a part of this. I really, truly am so grateful. I was in tears this morning just in gratitude for this community. I really feel like you guys are family to me, you know, and especially when I get emails or notes and I have been getting those. Thank you so much. In my mailbox, I love handwritten letters and I've been getting some and I just thank you for that. A video coming on gratitude for the things I've received. Uh, just have to find the time to be able to film that. But regardless, I just am grateful. You know, even whenever I receive correction, I'm grateful for that because it, it strengthens my own character because it stings a little bit at first. And then I'm like, can I humble yourself? Take the correction, especially whenever it's something that the Lord is convicting my own heart over, you know, and somebody confirms that I'm like, ouch, that hurt. But once I take it as what it is and I humble myself and I say, thank you for that, it brings so much freedom. And I just feel like that is such a word for so many of us. You know, when whenever there's criticism or correction in our spirit, it never feels good. But whenever you humble yourself before it and you receive it and you just say, you know what, I'm sorry. Thank you so much for that. Man, there's freedom in that. It is a beautiful thing. So anyway, let's pray before we get into the word so we can invite the Lord here. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for who you are, for being in our midst, God. Thank you so much that, you know, we are so small on this earth, yet you are still near to us. You draw us closer to you and you desire to have us in your arms and in your presence all the time. And so I just pray, Lord, that as we do that, as we draw near to you, as we read your word, I pray that we'll feel those loving arms around us today, that we will know that you are in our midst and forgive us of our sins, Lord, where you need to make some corrections. We give you that permission to do so, God. And even though it might hurt a little bit, I just pray that we will have a heart of humility to be able to receive the correction, to ask for forgiveness where necessary, and Lord, also to forgive those who might have actually come against us where we didn't deserve whatever was being done to us. Keep us from evil, Lord. Keep us from the evil one. Protect us today. Meet our needs, oh God. But I pray that all of this be done for the glory of your name. May we always be able to shine your love and your light to the world so that we can bring you glory, so that we can make you recognizable to those who might not know you, oh God. We love you so much and are thankful for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're starting off here in chapter 25 with the prophecy against the Ammonites or Ammon, which were a nomadic tribe, and it is in today's modern day Jordan. And the capital of Jordan today is still Ammon, but it is a different spelling, A-M-M-A-N. And these are descendants from Lot and his daughter, 
which essentially makes them cousins of Israel. If you want more references about the Ammonites, I've written some down here in the notes. And so we see this whole judgment coming into the surrounding nations all throughout Ezekiel. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, set your face toward the Ammonites and prophesy against them. Say to the Ammonites, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God, because you have said, aha, over my sanctuary. So basically, whenever Israel was destroyed or Judah was destroyed, the Ammonites came against them and were like, good for you. When it was profaned and over the land of Israel, when it was made desolate and over the house of Judah, when they went into exile, therefore, behold, I am handing you over to the people of the east. Now, we don't know exactly who these people are. It could have been the people of Bedouin, the nomadic tribes, as uh, spoken in Judges chapter six. It could be the Ishmaelites or it could be Babylon. But regardless, God is using someone to bring judgment against them. For a possession, and they shall set their encampments among you and make their dwellings in your midst. They shall eat your fruit, and they shall drink your milk. I will make Rabbah a pasture for camels, and Ammon a fold for flocks. Then you will know that I am the Lord, always his purpose, right? For thus says the Lord God, because you have clapped your hands and stamped your feet and rejoiced with all the malice within your soul against the land of Israel, Therefore, behold, I have stretched out my hand against you and will hand you over as plunder to the nations, and I will cut you off from the peoples and will make you perish out of the countries. I will destroy you. Then you will know that I am the Lord. And I just love so much how this displays the heart of God, you know, how much he cares for his people. And this still goes for us today. Whenever people come against you, I mean, this is one of those hopes that we can hold on to is that God will always deal. And not that we hope for judgment against people who come against us, but it's just knowing that he will and that he will take care of you and that he will protect you. We may not be able to see it on this side of eternity, but everyone will be held accountable for what they have done. And that includes those who have come against you. And now we move into the prophecy against Moab. Moab being the other descendants from Lot and his older daughter. And Seir being south of Ammon and descendants of Esau. So Seir is a city in Edom. So again, this making them also cousins of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, because Moab and Seir said, behold, the house of Judah is like all of the other, <laughs> all of the other nations, excuse me, can't speak. And so basically they are not mocking Israel's destruction the way that the Ammonites did, but they are kind of spiritual in the sense that they're like, you know what? They may have a God, but their God is just like all the other gods. I mean, they really thought that there were multiple ways to get to heaven or to have kind of this eternal life and to be enlightened. So in a sense, this was declaring God almighty as powerless. So this is why they are going to be judged here. Therefore, I will lay open the flank of Moab from the cities, from its cities on its frontier, the glory of the country. So this is referring to the side or the shoulder in the northwest corner. And this was an area that they probably felt was the most impenetrable because it was a mountainous region, uh, really fortified in that sense. So they're saying basically the entire portion of this area. Beth Jeshimoth, Baal Mian, and Kiriathaim. I will give it along the Ammonites to the people of the east as a possession that the Ammonites may be remembered no more among the nations, and I will execute judgments upon Moab. Then they will know that I am the Lord. And of course, we know that the Ammonites perished. They were essentially absorbed by the Arabs. Now we see the prophecy against Edom being the descendants of Esau. This is south of Moab. Thus says the Lord God, because Edom acted revengefully against the house of Judah and has grievously offended in taking vengeance on them. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will stretch out my hand against Edom and cut off from its man from it man and beast. So they had kind of this perpetual animosity against Israel. They were constantly at war. And of course, that going back to Jacob and Esau and their relationship, and it continues today. And I will make it desolate from Teman even to Dedan. These are kind of unknown locations, but basically, again, saying the entire region. They shall fall by the sword, and I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel. And they shall do in Edom according to my anger and according to my wrath. And they shall know my vengeance, declares the Lord God. Now we move to the prophecy against Philistia. This being in the area of today's Gaza Strip, which we know is always a place of war. 
and uh, also known as Southwest Palestine along the Mediterranean coast. Thus says the Lord God, because the Philistines acted revengefully and took vengeance with malice of soul to destroy in never ending enmity. So basically they have a really long history of having this kind of hostile relationship. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will stretch out my hand against the Philistines and I will cut off the Kirithites and destroy the rest of the seacoast. So the Kirithites could be known as the Cretans, the people from Crete. This is basically saying all the people of the Philistines who have migrated from those different areas. I will execute great vengeance on them with wrathful rebukes. Then they will know that I am the Lord when I lay my vengeance upon them. So notice how many times vengeance is stated in this section. Because they took vengeance upon Israel, God will then uh, execute his vengeance upon them. So it's kind of like the judgment fitting the sin. Also notice that he makes no reference to who will destroy Philistia. And so when he says, I will stretch out my hand, this goes to show that this judgment is going to come straight from God, which means they're going to face the most severe judgment among all of the people. And now in chapters 26 through 28, which we will only cover 26 and 27 today, but this is the prophecy against Tyre. So we will see three chapters of this prophecy. Tyre being the northern boundary of Israel. It was a seaport town. It was probably the greatest commercial center in all history at this time. And typically caravans would travel, caravans, from Tyre and they would go down to Egypt to do all of this trade. So they would have to pass through Israel. And because they did so, they were heavily taxed by Israel along the way. And eventually when Israel is destroyed, now they will no longer be under that taxation because there's no Jews to be able to tax them. So this means that they have higher profit margins now uh, as they travel from Tyre to Egypt to do their trade. So in the 11th year, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, because Tyre said concerning Jerusalem, aha, the gate of the peoples is broken. It is swung open to us. I shall be replenished now that she is laid waste. So this is talking about the fact that they are now able to just go through the land without being taxed. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you, O Tyre, and will bring up many nations against you, which did in fact happen. There were many people who came against Tyre. As the sea brings up its waves, they shall destroy the walls of Tyre and break down her towers, and I will scrape her soil from her and make her a bare rock. So this showing her complete destruction in the end. She shall be in the midst of the sea, a place for the spreading of nets, for I have spoken, declares the Lord God. And when it talks about the fact that this city is going to be a spreading of nets, meaning it is going to be basically a fishing village, which it is today. If you go to the, sp the place where Tyre once was, that's all it is now. It's just a small fishing village. And her daughters on the mainland shall be killed by the sword. Then they will know that I am the Lord. So these daughters of the mainland being the colonies of Phoenicia, their allies. So this included places like Cyprus, Spain, Sicily. There were other places as well, but I, could, I just listed a few there. For thus says the Lord God, behold, I will bring against Tyre from the north Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, king of kings with horses and chariots and with horsemen and a host of many soldiers. He will kill with the sword of your daughters on the mainland. He will set up a siege wall against you and throw up a mound against you and raise a roof of shields against you. So this did happen just a few years after this prophecy. Nebuchadnezzar does lay siege to Tyre for a good 13 years before he is able to finally get into Tyre. So they are being described as having this greed. They are materialistic. They are prideful. They are opportunistic. And anybody who is glad at the calamity will not go unpunished, according to Proverbs 17.5. And that's exactly what we are seeing here. He will direct the shock of his battering rams against your walls, and with his axes, he will break down your towers. His horses will be so many that their dust will cover you. Your walls will shake at the noise of the horsemen and wagons and chariots when he enters your gates as men enter a city that has been breached. With the hoofs of his horses, he will trample all of your streets. Now, we know that Babylon had many a chariots, many a horses. They had a strong military force. So this is just showing how powerful this siege will be against them. 
He will kill your people with the sword and your mighty pillars will fall to the ground. They, so notice the change in the pronoun from he to they. So this is referring to all of the people who will come against them. Will plunder your riches and loot your merchandise. They will break down your walls and destroy your pleasant houses. Your stones and timber and soil they will cast into the midst of the waters. And I will stop the music of your songs and the sound of your lyres shall be heard no more. I will make you a bare rock. You shall be a place for the spreading of nets, and you shall never be rebuilt, for I am the Lord. I have spoken, declares the Lord. Now, the interesting thing is here is that all of this was fulfilled, one, by Nebuchadnezzar. In 525 BC, we see the Persian conquest. And then in 332 BC, Alexander the Great comes against them, and he ends up with all of his people pushing the rubble into the sea, which creates this causeway for them to be able to get into this area here. Eventually, it becomes inhabited by the Muslims, and then the Crusaders come in AD 1290. They drive out the Muslims and make it their capital city, but then the Muslims come back in and recapture it, and eventually they throw all of the area into the sea because they feel like it's been defiled by the Christians. And so that ultimately ends up fulfilling this prophecy right here. Now, historians say that the chances of this prophecy being fulfilled was like one in 75 million. And there we see the power of God and his spoken word and the fact that it is so real for them to have prophesied this, for Ezekiel to have spoken this word and only one chance in 75 million of all of this being fulfilled. And it truly did happen. So one thing to note too is the fact that in God's mercy, he actually delayed this judgment for a very long time. It wasn't completely fulfilled until the 14th century. Because if you remember, Jesus, Paul, they visit and they minister in this area of Tyre. So this continues on for a very long time before God actually fulfills this prophecy. Thus says the Lord God to Tyre, will not the coastlands shake at the sound of your fall? When the wounded groan, when slaughter is made in your midst, then all the princes of the sea will step down. So the princes of the sea referring to the rulers of the areas that are connected to Tyre because they eventually end up submitting to Babylon. So they will step down from their thrones and remove their robes and strip off their embroidered garments. They will clothe themselves with trembling. They will sit on the ground and tremble every moment and be appalled at you. And they will raise a lamentation over you and say to you, how you have perished, you who were inhabited from the seas, O city renowned, who was a mighty, who was mighty on the sea. She and her inhabitants imposed their terror on all her inhabitants. Now the coastlands tremble on the day of your fall and the coastlands that are on the sea are dismayed at your passing. For thus says the Lord God, when I make you a city laid waste, like the cities that are not inhabited, when I bring up the deep over you. So this word, the deep, is the same word that was used in Genesis chapter one that refers to the chaotic waters of creation. And the great waters cover you. Then I will make you go down with those who go down to the pit, the people of old. And I will make you to dwell in the world below among ruins from of old with those who go down to the pit so that you will not be inhabited. So this pit is a synonym for hell. So they're being compared to those who are thrown into hell. And remember again that it was the people who actually did throw them into the sea, like all of the rubble. It was completely cleared out. And today, still just a fishing village. Now, with the amount of water that comes into this area, it really should be a thriving city. If you look at the geography of thriving cities, it's always based around water. And so this really should be a place like that. But to keep with the fulfillment of the prophecy, it wasn't ever rebuilt into a thriving city that it once was. Continuing the second half of verse 20, but I will set beauty in the land of the living. I will bring you to a dreadful end and you shall be no more. Though you be sought for, you will never be found again, declares the Lord God. And now we see this lament for Tyre in chapter 27. The word of the Lord came to me. Now you, son of man, raise a lamentation over Tyre and say to Tyre, who dwells at the entrances to the sea, merchant of the peoples to many coastlands. Thus says the Lord God. O oh, Tyre, you have said, I am perfect in beauty. So this shows their pride. They really thought that they had no limits. Your borders are in the heart of the seas. Your builders made perfect your beauty. Now they had superior construction. This is describing 
the way that they once were. They made all your planks of fir trees from cedar, cedar being an Amorite term for Mount Hermon. They took a cedar from Lebanon to make a mast for you. Of oaks of Bashan, they made your oars. So Bashan being that fertile plateau east of the Sea of Galilee and Upper Jordan. So we're seeing kind of this picture of a beautiful ship that is made. They made your deck of pines from the coast of Cyprus inlaid with ivory. A fine embroidered linen from Egypt was your sail. Now, a sail is a symbol of their self-assurance and their pride. It's kind of like a flag. And so I just had a heart check here. What does your sail look like? Like, what is the flag or the banner that flies above your life? If just listed a couple of things here, patriotism, pride, humility, is it a flag or a sail of criticism, of self-loathing loathing and victimhood? There are a lot of different flags that we can all fly and it can change seasonally. So heart check, what does your sail look like today? Is it a sail that reflects the heart and the glory of God? Or is it a sail that simply reflects your own emotions and as a result of worldliness? Regardless, this is a picture of her beautiful decor. Serving as your banner, blue and purple from the coast of Elisha. This area, unknown, but it could be somewhere near Italy or Sicily, and that was your awning. The inhabitants of Sidon and Arvad, these being cities of Tyre, Sidon was a Phoenician seaport about 30 miles north of Tyre, and Sidon was typically a rival city of Tyre, and Arvad is on the island off the coast, and this is the northernmost town of this area. So these were your towers, your skilled men, Otire, were in you, and they were your pilots. So he, they also had basically like first-class workers. The elders of Gibal and her skilled men were in you, caulking your seams. So Gibal being a Phoenician city between Sidon and Arvad, all the ships of the sea with their mariners were in you to barter for your wares. Now, what's interesting here is that remember that Ezekiel is in Babylon. And so the fact that he is made aware of all of these details, and this continues, the details continue down here, is just incredible to me because they didn't have the internet back then. They didn't have social media. So how was he truly to know all of these details to be able to prophesy these things and to write them down? I just thought that that was pretty incredible. Persia and Lud and Put, these two places here uh, being Lud in the Asia Minor, known as Lydia, Put, known as Libya, so being in Africa, were in your army as your men of war. They hung the shield and helmet in you. They gave you splendor. Men of Arvad and Helic were on your walls all around, and men of Gamad were in your towers. They hung their shields on your walls all around, and they made your perfect beauty." Tarshish, this could be Spain, did business with you because of your great wealth of every kind. Silver, iron, tin, and lead, they exchanged for your wares. So now we're going to see all of the people who were trading with and doing business with Tyre. And this is really just kind of showing us a description of how incredibly prosperous they were. Javen, this being an area in Greece, it's a Greek settlement in Arabia. Tubal and Meshech, this could be modern day Turkey traded with you. They exchanged human beings. So sadly, they were involved in slave trade and vessels of bronze for your merchandise. From Beth to Garma, so these are possibly men of Armenia in Eastern Asia Minor, they exchanged horses, war horses, and mules for your wares. The men of Dedan traded with you. Dedan also refers to roads. Many coastlands were your own special markets. They brought you in payment ivory tusks and ebony. Syria did business with you because of your abundant goods. They exchanged for your wares emeralds, purple, embroidered work, fine linen, coral, and ruby. Judah in the land of Israel traded with you. They exchanged for your merchandise wheat of Minith. Minith was in Ammon. It was famous for fine wheat. Meal, honey, oil, and balm. Balm having medicinal properties. 
Damascus, this is the capital of Syria, did business with you for your abundant goods because of your great wealth of every kind. Wine of Helben, so Helben was north of Damascus and they were wine producers. And wool of Sahar, Sahar had an abundance of goats and sheep, so obviously wool coming from there. And casks of wine from Uzal, they exchanged for your wares. Wrought iron, cassia, cassia uh, could be referring to cinnamon or some sort of aromatic that they use for perfume, and calamus were bartered for merchandise. Calamus is a reed that is found in the swamp areas, and it was actually an oil producer. Deedon traded with you in the saddle cloths for riding, and I apologize, I know it's starting to get a little messy here. <laughs> Arabia and all the princes of Kedar, Kedar being a nomadic tribe in Arabia, were your favored dealers in lambs, rams, and goats. Um... Sorry, I can't. In these, they did business with you. The traders of Sheba and Rama traded with you. They exchanged for your wares the best of all kinds of spices and all precious stones and gold. Haran, being a merchant city that was on the Euphrates River somewhere in eastern Turkey. Canna and Eden, traders of Sheba, Asher, and Kilmad traded with you. In your market, these traded with you in choice garments and clothes of blue and embroidered work and in carpets of colored material bound with cords and made secure. The ships of Tarshish traveled for you with merchandise, so you were filled and heavily laden in the heart of the seas. Okay, that was a lot, I know, but this is really just showing us a picture of the fact that they had this free-flowing trade going on with all of these places around them, so many different materials flowing through. So they were basically this economic powerhouse, and they had no regard for God. They were really just depending on their wealth and their trade and their economic prosperity. So all of these people being the nearest trade partners. Your rowers have brought you out into the high seas. The east wind has wrecked you in the heart of the seas, probably referring to Babylon. So this is now, we're seeing a picture of a shipwreck that will now affect the trade all around. So everything was amazing basically until it wasn't. Your riches, your wares, your merchandise, your mariners and your pilots, your caulkers, dealers in merchandise, all your men of war who are in you, all your crew that is in your midst, sink into the heart of the seas on the day of your fall. So everything, their glory, their wealth, their strength, it all goes down with the ship. At the sound of the cry of your pilots, the countryside shakes, and down from their ships come all who handle the oar. So this country shot, countryside being the pasture land or the common land, the mariners and all the pilots of the sea stand on the land and shout aloud over you and cry out bitterly. They cast dust on their heads and wallow in ashes. They make themselves bald for you and put sackcloth on their ways. So we're seeing these traditional signs of mourning happening. And they weep over you in the bitterness of soul with bitter mourning. In their wailing, they raise a lamentation for you and lament over you. Who is like Tyre, like one destroyed in the midst of the sea? When your wares came from the seas, you satisfied many peoples. With your abundant wealth and merchandise, you enriched the kings of the earth. Now you are wrecked by the seas in the depths of the waters. Your merchandise and all your crew in your midst have sunk with you. All the inhabitants of the coastlands are appalled at you, and the hair of their kings bristles with horror. Their faces are convulsed. The merchants among the peoples hiss at you. You have come to a dreadful end and shall be no more forever. So the people around them really should have learned and repented at this point, but they didn't. So they instead are going to hiss at them, but they too will be judged and come to a dreadful end. So this lament here is sort of an advanced demonstration of what the world will feel whenever Babylon the Great falls in the end in Revelation, or otherwise known as Satan's kingdom. But it goes to show that, you know, riches without God never will satisfy the human heart. And this lament here will likely be chanted over and over by the trade partners because they'll be greatly troubled. You know, it sounds like they're lamenting for Tyre, but really it's for themselves because they're the ones who are affected. They're greatly troubled by Tyre's defeat. And they will eventually themselves turn against Tyre in hopes of being able to escape Babylon. Because of course, Anybody who forms an alliance with anybody who Babylon is coming against, of course, will be a threat to them. So it's just sad here to see this beautiful, thriving city that was so prideful, of course, in their material wealth and their 
prosperity and their success fall in the end. And it really just goes to show the power of God and how little and powerless we truly are under the hand of God. And I think it's really humbling for us, not only as a people, but as a nation, to keep our hearts humble before the Lord. And it just takes a moment. You know, we're seeing it all around the world. And I always question whether or not we're seeing more and more destruction because we're just more aware of it and we're more exposed to it by way of the media. But it's pretty incredible to be to see the things that are happening, kind of like the birth pangs of the end times, you know, like the wildfires and the storms and the flooding and all kind of stuff. It just seems like one thing after another. And I don't ever want to put fear into anybody, but when you see those things, you can't help but think, man, I mean, is this happening? Is this the hand of God where we are seeing the sign of the times, the sign of the end times? But that's a glorious thing. This should give us more hope that God's word is proving true. So I don't know about you, but it does strengthen my faith whenever I see those things. As hard as it is and as sad as it is, you know, and we do mourn and lament over the things that happen, especially at the loss of life. It doesn't seem fair, but we just have to hold on to the hope that God is in control, that he is sovereign and that he still stands in his majesty he still is on the throne and that you know everything happens for his purpose so thank you so much lord for this word thank you for strengthening our faith through it for humbling us lord and i just pray that we will never become so prideful in our own lives in our nation i pray god for a a humbling in our own hearts before god you have to bring that humbling upon us I pray, Lord, that we will be open and enlightened by your revelation so that we do not have to be enlightened by your judgment. Thank you, Lord, for that reminder today. Thank you so much for this community. Thank you for the ability to be able to have more time to learn about you, to hear your heart, and to just draw closer and closer to you. May we never take it for granted, oh God. We never know when our time is up. And so I just pray that we will not go another day without seeking you, seeking your face, and just wanting to know you more and get closer to you. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Heaven is a divine gift to us that is given by grace. We're not going to get it because we are indeed righteous. We are getting it because God loves us. But again, we will not receive that promised land. We will not receive that gift of eternal life if we don't receive Jesus. So I want to give someone that opportunity today who is saying, I've never done that. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm going to go after I die, but I see now that that is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're going to say a prayer. I'm going to put the words on the screen so you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and when you confess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord, that he died and he rose again, then you will be saved. So let's pray this prayer, believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I thank you that all of my sins are forgiven. I confess of my sin, I turn from them and I live my life for you. So I receive you now as Lord and Savior of my life. I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.